Thank you for tuning in to worship with us here at the Burbridge Pentecostals in Burbridge, Louisiana. We're so glad that you've chosen to be with us today. Stay tuned after service for more information regarding our social media outlets and giving opportunities. We sincerely hope that today is a day of blessing, healing, and restoration in your life. Service will begin momentarily. God bless you. Here, God, we're believing you, Lord, for great things today, Jesus. Lord, we magnify and we praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of mine. Thank you, Jesus, it has won. Me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life and brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb. Of sin, you were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again, and now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is there anyone here today that's thankful for the blood of Jesus? That song says there is nothing greater, there is nothing stronger than the blood. No matter what you have need of this morning, there's nothing greater than the blood of Jesus that can be applied to your life today. I'm reminded of the old song, there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. I don't know about you, but I don't want to ever forget about the power in the blood. There's power to redeem. There's power to save. There's power to heal this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
So thankful for the blood today. So thankful for the blood. We want to welcome you to the Brobridge Pentecostals. We're so glad that you've joined us in service today. Amen. Amen. Our service schedule is as follows. Sunday worship at 9 and 11, 15 a.m. Monday prayer at 6.30 p.m. and Live on our family page at 7. And then midweek service here Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Harvest Fest is happening this Sunday from 5 to 7 p.m. I know we're all excited about that. Please continue to bring candy donations and place them in the basket located in the foyer. The person who does bring the most uh, candy will receive, uh, receive a gift card, so please remember to label everything that you do bring. The deadline to register to host a trunk for Trunk or Treat is tonight at midnight. We do need more people to be involved with that, so please register by tonight at midnight if you'd like to host a Trunk or Treat. You may also pre-register for Harvest Fest by October 30th, which is next Saturday. Um, if you do that, you will be entered into a drawing for a $50 Visa gift card. Both of these things can be done through the Planning Center app. Also, be sure to pick up some postcard flyers in the back. There's still a few on the foyer table. Help us get the word out about Harvest Fest. Um, this is a great event, a great outreach for our church, and we need your help to get the word out. Amen. This Friday, for everyone that's involved as a part of the Harvest Fest Dream Team, uh, Dream Team which means you're volunteering in any capacity, this Friday, October 29th, we will have a, a meeting for Harvest Fest at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. If you're volunteering, please make an effort to be here. Um, it's a very important meeting to make sure everything goes smoothly, everything goes as we need it to go. Amen. If you would like to dedicate your child up to age 18, you're invited to participate in our quarterly child dedication service on Sunday, November 14th. This will happen after the 11.15 a.m. service. The deadline to register for that is Wednesday, November 10th at midnight, and registration can also be done through the Planning Center app for that if you're interested. We want to thank you for being faithful by being at church today or watching online. We want to thank you for praying for one another throughout the week, and we want to thank you for continuing to give. God is doing some great things in our church, and it's because of your giving. Amen. Amen. There are three ways to give financially. Those giving options are going to appear on the screen at this time. You can give online at thebridgeloves.com forward slash give. You can mail general offerings and building fund to the address shown on the screen, or you can also text to give by following the prompts shown on the screen at this time. And as a reminder, we have a secure giving box located, uh, located to your right on the wall as you exit the sanctuary. Feel free to put any tithing, offering, or building fund in there as well. Amen. If you'll stand with me this morning, we're going to read our tithing and offering scripture as well as our prayer together before we give. Amen. Amen. Job 22 and 28 says, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Malachi 3 and 8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Upon the authority and by the orders of your word, I have given, and it shall be given to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither and a giver of offerings. I bring my tithes and offerings today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts dismissed, royalties received, my whole family saved and walking with God, perfect health, abundance, and to walk in divine favor and blessings. I shall be blessed coming in, I shall be blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen, and it is so. If you believe that today, put your hands together. And worship with the praise team. Wandering into the night Watching a place to hide this weary soul This bag of bones So I tried with all my might And I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond And just when I ran out of road I met a man I didn't know 
told me that I was not alone. He picked me up, he turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because He healed my heart, changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. Come on, that's it. Thank Him. Oh, yes, Jesus. And not deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friend. Burning and bitterness You just can't keep it moving Now nah, you ain't welcome here Hey From now till I walk the streets of gold I sing of how you saved my soul This way we're done This found this way back Oh, oh You pick me up You turn me around Place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. Because He healed my heart. Changed my name. Forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. He healed me up. He turned me around. Place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank the Savior. Heal my heart, change my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. I thank 
I think we ought to take somebody by the hand all over the house and just lift it towards heaven. I think we ought to lift our voice. There's such a beautiful presence of the Lord that's already here. I feel deliverance here this morning. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Well, that's it. I want you to turn and pray for your neighbor. Turn and pray for your neighbor right now. Do what you feel in the Holy Ghost here right now. Turn and pray for your neighbor. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Amen. Why don't we clap our hands and lift our voices? What a beautiful presence of God. Thank you, Jesus. 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 God, praise God. Turn to your neighbor and said, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord this Sunday morning. Amen. I like that song. I like that song. Anybody else remember when God called your name to come out of that grave? Amen. Amen. And uh, thank you, Brother Seth, for stepping up. Brother Matthew's sick this morning. And uh, he's the one that usually sings that song. And uh, Brother Seth did a really wonderful job, didn't he? Amen. I thank the Lord for that. Praise God. And, uh, I think everybody took my advice. I think I texted everybody Friday and said, our 9 a.m. is overloaded. Can you? Y'all took that serious. Amen. So that 1115 better be packed or there will be another text message later this afternoon. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I did have a phone update, and it messed up my text deal. I texted everybody last night, and I think only 30 people got it, and it just messed us one of those deals. That's why I don't like those updates. Sometimes those updates are setbacks. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm so glad that my pastor is here this morning, Brother Morgan. <laughs> Love Brother Morgan so much. And uh, I give honor to him. He's going to be preaching to us here in the next few minutes. Uh, let me say thank you to everybody uh, that's been praying and doing the best we could to support. So glad that Sister Jane Matron is here this morning. We love you, honey. So thankful that she's here. So, I, uh, we buried her sweet husband Monday, and the pastor wasn't able to be there due to sickness. And I uh, heard it was a beautiful funeral, beautiful celebration of life. And then Brother Coke yesterday with his mother in California and uh, heard that that was a beautiful service. And then Brother Lamont and uh, Brother Freddie's sweet mama that we put to rest yesterday. And uh, what a beautiful service that was. Presence of God moved in at the graveside. And I'm pretty sure we scared the funeral director, Brother <laughs> Freddie. Because when I turned around to give it to him, he didn't know what to do. And I said, I think we should ask the pallbearers to put their boot. And he goes, I think that's a good idea. And I said, then we're gonna, I'm going to follow the cast. He said, oh, yeah, let's just do it. I said, he doesn't know. <laughs> but I guess, you know, people started speaking in tongues, lifted their hands to pray. And I'm telling you, if we'd have let it go, we probably would have had ourselves an altar call right there. And I think she would have wanted that. And so, anyway, thank you for allowing me to be a part of that to the Abraham family, uh, to Sister Jane. We love you so much. And then also the Cokes. Amen. 
so much loss. We've had four deaths in one week, and uh, my aunt's funeral will be in Houston on Saturday. I'm going to try to make it back. We have Harvest Best Sunday, um, so I'm not staying in Houston Sunday. I'm going to go over there for the funeral, my family, and then we'll come back. So pray for us. Uh, we lost her due to complications with COVID. Um, she went to the hospital a little too late. She waited about four or five days, and she had health complications. Um, but amen God knows and I trust him I trust him Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die and so every one of us have that appointment it's just at different times and uh, we just have to trust the Lord he knows what he's doing and we have comfort in that it is so good to have brother and sister Brandon here all the way from Starks love them so much praise God and, uh, I think he was there, if I remember correctly, when I started my ministry doing funerals, you were there in Starks. That's how I started. Uh, I didn't know if that was a good sign for me uh, to start ministry preaching funerals, but that's how it started. And it was mostly family members, and he's been there the whole way. I love him and his wife and family. Appreciate them. Again, I'm glad Brother Morgan's here. It's always a treat. Always a treat. Um, we're very blessed, very blessed to have him. And I said, just take your time. So I think we were here Tuesday. Lord, help us till after 10. And Brother Marcelli was apologizing and said, I don't preach that long at home. I said, well, there's a, there's a preaching bug here in the, in the pulpit. And uh, I've heard a lot of people say that. I didn't, even Brother Klein did. He puts a little timer up there for 30 minutes, and I don't think he's watched that timer one time. Since he's been up here, and I said, just take your time. We love preaching. Uh, we are begotten by the word. We're saved by the word. And uh, I think where we've kind of missed some things is we want less teaching and preaching and uh, more events. And so I think we should get back to more preaching and teaching. And I think that would help us. Amen. Amen. So... I looked up, I just happened to look up my message from Battle Cry last year. I didn't listen to it because I can't listen to myself preach. But when I saw that I went like an hour and 50 minutes, I said, that may be too long. Um, that may have been too long. That may be the limit. But I believe in good teaching and preaching. And uh, it establishes the people of God. And we need it. Amen. So I want us to prepare ourselves. Brother Morgan, just come take your time. The next service is not till 11.15. And if we go all the way through 11.15, that's fine, too. And as he's about to come, I'm glad Brother and Sister Story are here as well. They're such a blessing to our church. Uh, a lot of the updates you're seeing, that's them. They've been fixing stuff all over the church and the fellowship hall. Uh, if you go to the back, they did this beautiful thing. I don't know what that piping is for all the... That's not my deal. The exhaust deal. I wish we'd have done that 50 years ago. Because when we cook back there, it's like 400 degrees. And now it's not. And that's all we needed was that little pipe. Where have you been all of my life? What a story. And why didn't we think of that as well? Amen. But when I walked in there and I saw that, I said, that's what that's for. I'm not a, an electrician. Amen. But I'm glad he is. So they've been helping us so much. And I thank God for them. I want us to pray as Brother Morgan comes. I'm going to ask the Lord to prepare our hearts. Um, I really feel like He has something for us. And so I want you to just lift your hands all over the house. Let's lift our voices to the Lord. Father, I'm asking You to anoint our minds, our hearts, our spirits. Anoint our emotions, Lord, to receive Your Holy Word. Anoint the man of God. Give Him strength in His body. Strength in His mind. Pray that you would use him in a very special way here this morning. Father, let your holy word fall on good ground. Let it take root and let it bear fruit worthy of you, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll give you all of the praise and all of the glory and all of the honor. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Let's continue to clap and magnify the Lord this morning. <clears throat> Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, thank God for it. We um, appreciate the ability to assemble more than I think I ever have. And uh, we went almost a solid year from March to March without being able to assemble. We had about three or four weeks in there. They let us. And then, of course, at that time, there's only 25% of the seating capacity. And, and uh, then they even said, you can uh, keep the doors of the church open, but you can't have more than one person in there at a time. And uh, <clears throat> so we went to streaming. Thank God for streaming. And uh, I think streaming takes it right to the devil. He's the prince in the power of the air. So anytime we get on, on the air, airwaves, we're on his territory. And so, but, you know, uh, it's kind of hard. So we went from preaching to the church to preaching to all the tech people. And they're just not the most spiritual people in the world. Not, you guys are here. You're an exception to the rule. And uh, so, but uh, we thank the Lord for the ability to assemble. I think, I think it's biblical. I think it's biblical that we assemble. I think the New Testament teaches that. They assemble to take communion. And they assembled to pray. And uh, so I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> I'm thankful for his blessings. Amen. It's always good to be in Bro Bridge. And Pastor Haygood and his family and this church family, I feel very safe when I'm here. And I feel like I'm in a place of strength. And I appreciate that very much. I've come many times here and probably got more than I gave. And so I, I value that. I thank you for your kindness and uh, your support. And I, I sincerely mean that. Amen. It's good to see everybody here today. And uh, so I need to go to work now. Amen. Uh, I really, really wanted to kind of uh, talk to you about some other things. And uh, the Lord this morning just kind of set the pace for it, and the direction for it, and so I'm going to follow him, and hopefully you'll follow me as I follow him. Amen. And we're going to try to do our best. Uh, I do want to say this at the very onset, and um, uh, I want to kind of give you a little target, spiritual target. Um, we, we are pressing toward, we're pressing toward uh, well, first of all, first of all, you can sit down. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> I um, I felt the other day. This is not my text or my, but I felt the other day very strong. And we're getting ready to have a uh, meeting in Tulsa this week. And I felt very strong the other day. The Lord kind of gave me a sense of direction. Uh, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I had this dream, and in the dream. I was kind of standing like I'm facing you, but right here to my immediate right was this swirling mass of stuff. And when I turned, I knew that it was the promises of God. It was the things of God. And then when I seen that, the Lord spoke one word, and that was hasten. Hasten. Uh, <clears throat> the scripture is very clear. When God decides to avenge, shall he not avenge his own? He does it very suddenly. And so I think that we're coming into a time uh, where there will be a strong visitation of the avenger. And he's coming to avenge some things. And some things that have been promised, some things that uh, God has spoken to us. It looks like that uh, the enemies tried to stop it and steal, take from the people of God. 
but I just believe if we'll just keep our hearts full of faith and not skepticism or unbelief or doubt or confusion, we'll keep our hearts full of faith, then I believe we're going to see a really divine visitation and we're going to see some tremendous things. Uh, anytime that God releases something from the heavens to come to the earth, and I'll talk about that here in just a second, uh, it has to pass through the enemy's territory. Did you know that? And so that's where the resistance is. Daniel proves to us those things. When he went to prayer, and 21 days later, finally Gabriel got to him. And uh, he said, the prince of Persia, the prince of Grecia withstood me. And uh, <clears throat> so... Let me tell you this, and I don't want to go too far into this, but when you read the word prince, I think most of the times, I know sometimes it refers to a literal physical prince, but I think of some of these regards when you talk about prince, you're talking about the spirit of a king or the spirit of a kingdom. So when it talks about the prince of Persia, it's talking about the spirit of Persia. And, of course, the spirit operates until a king is made manifest, which is a physical something. Uh, so the spirits of these kingdoms were already at work. And that shouldn't surprise us because Paul or John says, for the spirit of the Antichrist doth already work. So the prince of these kingdoms works until there is a physical manifestation of a king or a world ruler or whatever you want to call it. Most of the time they'd call these people king of kings. They ruled the entire world, almost nations. And so we know that the spirit and the prince, we know that the spirit of the Antichrist is working, but we also know that there's about to be a physical presentation of the one who's the son of perdition. He'll try to rule the world for a season. He'll achieve it. And so we know that that's going to happen, but we also know that Jesus Christ is referred to as the prince of peace. So the spirit of his kingdom is at work also. And the word peace there does not necessarily mean tranquility or absence of conflict, but it just basically means prospering, not just financial prospering, but all areas. You live in peace. Uh, you live in, in, in the kingdom of God. And so God takes care of his people. God takes care of his people. You're a living testimony of that. <clears throat> Amen. And uh, uh, I, I'm looking back there, and they got Abounding Grace, Bishop Mark Morgan, and they got Evangelist Doug. And I don't want that evil spirit getting on me back there. <laughs> I don't want his spirit getting on me here today, amen. And uh, so thing is, is I know that there's been some spiritual resistance and the spirit of other kingdoms is at work. And um, several years ago, I've, I've told this, I've shared it many, many times, but I feel to remind you, the Lord did show me the three spirits that would seek to stop the blessing of God from coming and uh, he showed it to me in the form of Buddha, uh, the Native American medicine man. And then he showed me with the two gay men, the three spirits. Uh, I got to a point where I thought I'd literally lost my mind. And that I was just, you know, you, you need to be more practical and get down to reality. You just dream all this stuff up. I was preaching a camp in uh, West Virginia, and I was standing in this this motel, and I can remember the chair. It was kind of an old beat-up, sunk-in chair. And I was sitting in it, and the enemy was really trying to torment me with that. And then finally the Lord said, so you think you dreamed all that up? He said, I showed that to you before you ever went to San Francisco. I showed that to you before you would ever be involved with Asia. Oklahoma, I understood. So I think those are the three spirits the three princes that are warring against us right now. And, of course, you are guilty by association. And so that flows down to this congregation. So 
I think a lot of the spiritual resistance that you're facing right now, especially in the areas of finance, has to do with those three spirits. So I think when you go to prayer, identify them. And then just keep hitting it until there's a breakthrough. Don't get frustrated. Don't get discouraged. You just keep hitting it. You keep hitting it. You keep hitting it. You just keep praying, you know, though he bear a long time with them. Uh, everything's about God's timing. It's about God's alignment. It's about coming in alignment with him to fulfill his purpose. And so God doesn't want to just bless us, but just bless us. Amen. But he intends for us to use his resources and the blessing that he bestows upon us to fulfill his purpose in our lives. And so I encourage you to keep praying, keep believing. You know, after a while, you kind of get tired of getting punched. Anybody know what I'm talking about right now? And it's just like, what in the world? This is crazy. This is crazy. I mean, this is, you know, then you kind of get to feeling like you're dysfunctional. What in the world's wrong with me? <clears throat> then you look around and see people that's not even trying to live halfway right. Man, I mean, life's great. And they just, you know, and I mean, and here you go. And you're kind of like, but just remember, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, <clears throat> my foot well nigh slipped. I mean, let me tell somebody something here. Don't ever mistake the blessing of God upon your life for God's approval. Because his blessing can also be a form to you of a, of a deception. What do you mean by that? God told 600,000 men of war and their wives, you will not enter the promised land. You're going to die in that wilderness. And, but guess what? Manna kept falling. Rock kept producing water. God kept putting shoes on their feet and clothes on their back. So he kept blessing even when they were in a wilderness. And so don't, don't ever think just because. And so when you look around, you're like, man, it doesn't make sense. These people, you know, I've had, I, I didn't mean to go here. I've had people, you know, uh, the only reason why they pay tithe is because they're afraid their transmission was going to fall out of their car. No, seriously. Man, I don't want the devourer coming into my life. But I've also seen people that didn't honor God with their substance. And they just kept getting raises and bonuses and all. And the, But what would happen is, is they would mistake that for God's approval on their life. Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost here a second. For God's approval on their life. So, uh, you know, just remember he's the Prince of Peace. We just keep doing what's right. God honors that. He's going to bless that. Amen. And so you're close to a breakthrough, so just keep pushing, keep keep kicking up against it. Amen. It's kind of like taking a hammer to something. It may not break the first time you hit it, but you just keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it, and finally you get a little crack in the wall. Don't stop there. Some people stop there and say, ooh, finally got a little break. No, don't, don't stop there. Don't stop till you knock the whole wall down. Amen. 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 We're getting ready to enter into a, a, a wonderful time of harvest. And uh, there's some things. It's time for these things to be fulfilled. And so <clears throat> I think that uh, this last year, two years, has been a time of preparation kind of getting us ready for what he really wants us to do. And so it's time for the kingdom to advance. I'm going to say it again. It's time for the kingdom to advance. Amen. It really is. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And I don't want to get into that. God's been couple, two or three things that he's really been dealing with me about. One of them is, and I'm not going to preach it here, one of them is is the, the understanding of the church and the kingdom. 
We have a good understanding of church and its culture, but I don't think we understand the kingdom. And uh, we understand the word church just simply means to assemble the ecclesia. So we got the assembling part down. Boy, it's quiet in here right now. And COVID taught us a few things. One of the things that COVID taught us was is that uh, a lot of people had a good relationship with the church, but they didn't with Jesus. And I mean, the moment they couldn't come to church. And I had people that I haven't come back to church for a moment. This have shocked me. And then I just got to realize, and it showed us where we're weak. We're weak in our homes. We expect the church to be the fix-all for everything. I want, I want to say something here that I said at home. You cannot put the responsibility of the church on training your children. No. Can't do it. You expect us to train your kids about an hour a week? No. But if we get in our homes, this is where the revival will start. This is where the fire will fall. It's just going to start in our homes and it's going to start in our families. And if we get it there, it'll hit the church. Let me, let me say this and then I'll tell you how to get the fire. If uh, Just imagine this. Get a little picture in your mind. If during the week, all of our homes and families, we were at the altar and God was setting us on fire, then when we assemble together, you've got many fires. But when we assemble together, it becomes one flame. Instead of coming to church and trying to catch on fire at church, We're taking care of that every day in our prayer. The altar. And boy, then when we come to church, look out. Our God is a consuming fire. And we get that flame burning strong enough, it doesn't matter what the enemy throws at you, God's going to consume it. The enemy can try to parade right in here, but if you get that consuming fire going, he can't, he, he can't stay. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, let's, let's, uh, uh, let's kind of get moving here. All right. Now I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to do something here today. I want to read from Proverbs 18, verse number 16. And, uh, thank you for your standing for the word. And, uh, now, I'm going to tell you something, and uh, before Sister Chenault died, she got on to me. She did. She got on to me, and she said, <clears throat> she, <laughs> she said, you don't need to preach any more than 50 minutes. <laughs> I'm just relaying the message. And she said, your body can't take it. Your physical body can't take it. You're punishing your body. So uh, anyway, so I just gave some of y'all hope here today. <laughs> so Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 16. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. You ever heard that before? We're going to talk about that. And uh, I want to talk about the altar today, the altar. Father, I love you. Thank you for the opportunity to stand before your people. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you'd give me clarity of mind and thought. Help me to get into the flow of your spirit and to flow with you today. I pray for your guidance and for your help. I ask that you would open our spiritual understanding Give me the ability to communicate what I feel like you've shown me in the spirit. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. I take authority in this service in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. 
God bless you. You can be seated here. I've heard this verse of scripture quoted a lot. And uh, I mean a lot. Man's gift will make room for him, bring him before great men. And we usually quote that verse or use that verse in regard to uh, telling somebody that feels like they have a gift, a ministry, a gift. Just be patient. Just wait. That gift is going to make room for you. And eventually it will bring you before great men. Anybody ever heard that before? How many of you have heard that before? Yeah. And I've heard people uh, tell people that. Just be patient. Wait. Your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men. But the fact is that verse really doesn't mean that. Let me read it to you in a way that might make a little bit more sense. If you want to talk with an important person, you must take a present to give him, and then he will let you see him. It was the custom of their times to know, and there's still some cultures that do this. Uh, the Chinese are very strong about this. Some of your Asian cultures are strong about this. When they come to visit you, they'll bring you a gift. Basically, every time Brother Caleb comes from China to visit us, uh, he'll bring gifts. And uh, it, it, that's, that's a lot of it. It's an honoring. And so the fact is, people knew that if you're going to go into the presence of a king especially, you couldn't go empty-handed. Matter of fact, the court chamberlain, the one that made sure everything in the court of a king was operating by procedure. And that court chamberlain, if you were going to go before the king, uh, he would tell you, now this is important, he would tell you uh, where you're going to stand. Then he would ask you what kind of offering have you brought, gift have you brought. And then, of course, he would tell you you can't go in there any way you want to. Because you're about to enter into the presence of royalty. So look the part, act the part, dress the part, be the part. And I want to be careful how I say this, but I almost kind of sense that ministry, apostolic ministry, is kind of like the court chamberlain. It's our responsibility to make sure that you get into the presence of God it's also our responsibility to teach you on how to get into the presence of God and to make sure that you're there the way that you ought to be. Praise God. Amen. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. Oh, yeah, somebody's going to tell you what to do. Your wife's probably telling you what to do. That's why you're so tough everywhere else. <laughs> Nobody going to tell me what to do. Well, you know, you just mad because you don't have any authority in your home, so you want to exercise it everywhere else. You ain't got any muscle to flex in the house, so you're going to flex it everywhere else. Mm, maybe I ought to give the altar call right now. I know women, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. Well, your mama still tells you what to do. I had a boy one time when I was passing Oak Moe. I mean, this little kid, you know, he's 17, senior in high school. And I mean, he was giving his mom fits. And, uh, you know, I, I talked to him a couple times, and he was just so disrespectful. So finally, she brought him in the office one day, and he's sitting there, and ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. He said, matter of fact, he said, I'm going to join the Navy. I said, I think that's a good idea. And he did. He come back from his training, his visiting. He come to church. <laughs> I went back there to him. I said, "Aren't you enjoying the Navy? Doesn't tell you what to do." 
And he knew. He said, you're right, Brother Morgan. I, I was wrong. I thought, well, they're teaching you something. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, but the fact is, is uh, let, let, let's, let's talk about this here. Uh, a man's gift will make room for him, bring him before great men. In other words, the only way you can get into the presence of a king is you had to present him a gift. Now, you also have to remember that the Scripture says that where the word of a king is, there's power. I studied that quite extensively the other day, and it just simply means whatever the king says, it's right. Matter of fact, there in Proverbs or Ecclesiastes where that's written, uh, the wise man is telling people, don't get caught up in any rebellion against the king. Because when you enter into a rebellion against the king, you have become his enemy. And it doesn't matter what you think about what he says. He's right. See, the problem with Americans, one of the problems, is we're a republic. And we the people. And so we view sometimes that that's how God operates his kingdom, by the will of the people. We got a right to vote on this. Bless God, I got rights. Well, that may work in America, but that don't work in God's kingdom. I, I want to say this kindly, but matter of fact, it doesn't matter what you think. The word of a king is right. You can fuss with it. You can argue with him. You can disagree with it. But, you know, in the end, so it's better for you to say, I'm going to go into the presence of the king. Right. And I'm going to accept his word as what's right. Now, I'm going real slow here because I'm just kind of getting you right in the crosshairs. Just kind of, you know. And uh, I, I want you to know that the first two things that God created was the heaven and the earth. And God's intent was that the earth would be in alignment. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. And God's intent was is for the earth and heaven to be in alignment. And in doing so, he established his authority in the earth by telling Adam, I'm going to give you dominion. This is dominion that I'm going to give you. As long as you stay in proper alignment, you're in obedience to my word, I'll give you authority and dominion here in the garden. But if you get out of alignment, we're going to have a little trouble. And so that's where things took a turn. Now, the deal is I, I'm interested in getting to the throne. I really am. I'm interested in getting to the throne. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to attempt to do this. And I, uh, now, some of you think that I joke and just say it about my notes but there's my notes stick figures arrows few words and uh, I maybe should have gave it to the team back there and they could have put it on the screen and uh, <clears throat> I, I want to know I want to know what it is that gives me the ability to get to God's throne. Uh, I will hasten into this. I've looked in the scripture, especially with the tabernacle. You have to understand the tabernacle, the temple, was considered God's throne. The mercy seat was considered God's throne. This is where God ruled. Scripture teaches you that. But you also have to understand that the high priest could not get to the mercy seat or the throne of God. That's why Hebrews says that Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of majesty, meaning the high priest would always stand on the right side 
of the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. That was his position. That was where he stood in authority. That is the position that God allowed him to stand. But the high priest knew very well that he could not get there if he did not, first of all, go by the altar. He knew better. Because it was the blood that was coming off the altar that would atone. And it was the blood that gave the ability to speak. And so the life is in the blood. And so he knew better. He knew better to try to attempt to go into the Holy of Holies without the blood. He knew there was two things that he needed to get into the Holy of Holies. That is blood and worship, a burning censer. He knew that. And so it's very important that you see this. Uh, if, if you look at this, you'll realize that in Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he said, I've seen him. I've seen his throne. I've seen, uh, I've seen his glory. But where did he see it? The Bible says it was in the temple that he's seen it. Then he talks about that off the, from the altar there are these live coals that were placed upon his lips. It was not until those live coals from the altar were placed upon his lips that he literally had the ability to speak for God now. I'll go. I'll speak. I'll do these things. Praise God. Uh, if you go from there and you get over into the book of Revelation, you're going to find consistent that where you see the throne and close proximity to the throne is an altar. It talks about Revelation chapter 6, the throne of God, but then underneath that altar was the souls of those that had been slain under the altar, saying, avenge us. Uh, we know that basically... Uh, that meant that the blood that come off the altar would fall and it would go to the base of the altar. So that's a little of the picture that you get to see about their souls being under the altar. That means that the body had already been slain. And now that which is eternal or the spirit is now speaking. And so I don't think that we have the ability to speak the things of the spirit until we've gone by the altar and this body has been taken care of. Where the word of a king is, there's power. Praise God. So I'm interested in what that means. And so then I got to looking at the word altar and uh, I just kept thinking there's something missing here. Now, growing up in the church, we used to have... Uh, uh, wood furniture up here. I don't know if you had it here, but churches. And uh, we call them the altar. And uh, I understood what we meant, but it was a symbol. It was a symbol. I don't really think it was the altar. I think it was a symbol of what the altar really is. We also used to have communion tables. We did. It was a symbol. And so I've seen churches almost getting knocked down drag outs when uh, they took the wood furniture out of, out of the church. My God, we're taking the altar right out of the church. And uh, I can remember having a dream years ago. I was in a building, and they were out front. There's a group of especially younger men, and they were dancing and rejoicing. And I looked down at one of them. I said, what are y'all so excited about? And they said, we've taken the altar out of the church. And uh, that's, that's bothered me a little bit. And, uh, you know, so when I've seen it, it's kind of like, okay, they've taken this piece of furniture out of the church. But then I begin to ask myself the question, what really is the altar? We tell people you need to come to the altar. What are we really telling them to do? You know, uh, I thank God for my son-in-law, Jeremy, and uh, because... He, he, he just thinks real practical. And uh, so I'll start telling him stuff, and um, uh, he'll say, okay, uh, 
I, I, I'm saying what you're talking about, but you got to break it down where people can understand it. He said, you're way up here with stuff. And he said, the rest of us are down here with stuff. And he said, so when you say altar, he said, I think I know what you mean, but how do we define the altar? What does it really mean? So that kind of got me on this little journey. Well, what really is the altar? I mean, when we say let's come to the altar. Uh, so I got to looking at it. Of course, the word altar in its truest sense is, is a place of slaughter. It's a bloody place. It's a place of slaughter. Uh, I also got to seeing where Abraham, Abraham teaches us how to build altars. Abraham built four altars, one altar he visited twice. And uh, so Abraham is known for building altars. So when you look in the Old Testament, it is a place of slaughter. But uh, it, it is, and this is one of the definitions to it is, it is a raised up something that you can place a sacrifice on. It is an elevated place. That's why they would build some altars with stones. Then the Bible talked about high places. In other words, there are certain places up in the mountains that have a little plateau there, but it was an elevated place. It was an elevated place above the earth. It's something that is above. And so it's there that the sacrifice was to be placed upon. I hope I can explain this. It's there that the sacrifice had to be placed upon. This raised up, this, this elevated level place. Now, then I got to trying to figure out because I, I, I said this. I, I was talking to Jeremy. I said, well, Jeremy, I said, uh, it's kind of like a platform. And uh, he said, yeah, that, that I, I could see that. I said, it's a platform that you place that you place a sacrifice on. And so that's the way I was trying to approach it. And then uh, I thought, no. So I went to definition of platform. And uh, it is an elevated structure, a level elevated structure for someone to stand upon. And then I realized, well, the difference between a platform and an altar is you stand on a platform. But you have to be laid upon the altar. You have to be horizontal on the altar. There's a lot of people that have a platform. We talk about platforms. We talk about platforms for politicians. What's their platform? Basically, what is the rule? What do they believe? What's their platform? And so I think that a lot of us have mistaken, and we think that we've built an altar, but actually... We've built a platform. We think we have the right and the ability to stand on our platform and to speak for God or to speak to God. And God says, I didn't ask you to get on that platform. I asked you to come to the altar. Now, if you'll come to the altar, I'll give you the platform. I'll give you an elevated place to stand before me that you can speak to me and I'll speak to you, but you can't get to that until you've come by the altar. So it still didn't, it still didn't, what really, I mean, what really is this thing called the altar? Well, uh, well let me give you some ideas, okay? Give you some ideas. One of the words for altar would also be a table. The altar would be a table. Uh, the table meaning this is a place that you would offer to a deity or a god food. You ever been in restaurants and see uh, people giving apples and oranges and stuff and they got little Buddha sitting over here and You ever notice that it's not on the ground? It's always in an elevated place. Now, I'm, I think we're going to start getting an idea about the altar. Amen. And uh, so that means Paul said to the Corinthians, I believe it was, you can't sit at the table of God, the Lord, and the table of devils at the same time. 
And so it means this is a place that we offer something to a deity or a god. So that's one of the ways that you could understand what the altar looks like. This is where I present and I put on this raised elevated place, I put, can I say it to you, food to a god or a sacrifice to a god or something on there that a god can consume. That's why your God is a consuming. But until you put something on that raised place, there's nothing for him to consume. Now, I want to say this, and I want to say it careful because I don't want to confuse you. Most people assume that prayer is the altar, but it's not. It's not. You can pray, but not have an altar. See, prayer is the platform you stand on. But the altar is where you die. And we got too many people standing just in prayer, but you're praying amiss. You're praying out of your own will. You're praying out of your own thinking. You're praying amiss. Boy, I don't like that. You know, I, you know, people, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray. Let me tell you something, okay? Let me tell you something. The reason why you have to pray so much is probably because you don't have an altar. Well, that went over real well. <laughs> After Elijah built that altar, his prayer was only 63 words. So if we'd spend more time in building an altar, it wouldn't take us as many words. I just messed with some of you right there. I, I just messed with some of you right there. Well, I, I, I pray an hour a day. I pray two hours a day. Well, that's good, but what's it accomplishing? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What makes you righteous before God? Well, it's, it's that which is imputed to you, but it's also something else. Seek ye first the kingdom and it's... So if I'm going to stand before him, I have to stand before him in righteousness. Now, if I stand before him in righteousness, right position, right standing, then that means my words will avail much. The king will hear what I've got to say. And then the king, this is really what prayer is about. It's not a monologue. It's a dialogue. So you go before him. You present your gift to him. You're standing there, and then he begins to speak. But you can't get there. See, some of you wonder why well, I just don't know why my prayer's not doing anything. I'm trying to help you understand it. I mean, God's been talking to me about the same stuff. I'm just preaching to myself today and making you listen. I mean, I'm kind of like, okay, God, why are our prayers not, you know? And I think that we're kind of, okay, all right, all right, all right. Let me get back to it right here. All right, now, uh, you ever heard the term? <laughs> Let me read this to you a little bit. Altar, a raised place on which sacrifices and gifts are offered in some religions, sometimes used figuratively. Here's one of the ways it's used figuratively. She sacrificed honesty on the altar of success. In other words, she chose, she chose to be dishonest in order to achieve success. So now I start seeing the altar as a place of choice. It is elevated in my thinking. I now have awareness. I'm at least allowing my mind to raise awareness to what it is that God wants me to put on that altar. And if I'm not willing to allow him to bring awareness into my mind and my spirit, I have no altar. I 
don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, yeah, let me explain to you a little bit better way, okay? Now, I just kind of feel settle in right here. Hey, let me explain to you a little bit better way, okay? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Oh. So that one got me. Okay, I really want to know what that one means. Now, what I found out was is that uh, I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies. So the gift that I'm supposed to present to him is this body. Mm. And if I don't present my body to him, then it's not true worship. True worship is when I come before the king, I present to him the gift. That's why when the devil came to Jesus, he said, if you'll just bow and worship me, I want you to surrender your will. I want you to surrender your ways to me, and I want you to worship me. Because worship means I have submitted and surrendered my will to this. And when he says, your body says a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I know we could get a lot of stuff about service there, but it literally means this is the way that you worship him. You truly worship him. Not just throwing your hands up saying, I love you, Jesus, but you truly worship him when you put that body of yours on the altar and you say, I'm not going to live the way I want to live. I'm going to live the way I'm a living sacrifice. I keep this body under subjection. Ooh. Let, me, let me read something to you here. Let me read something to you here. You got time? I, I, I seen this the other day and I copied it off and I, I just like, oh my Lord, this is tremendous. Listen to this. Satan disguises submission to himself under the ruse of autonomy. He never asked us to become his servants. Never once did the serpent say to Eve, I want to be your master. The shift in commitment is never from Christ to evil. It is always from Christ to self. And instead of his will, self-interest now rules, and what I want reigns, and that is the essence of of sin. See, if I stay on this earthly, it's about self-rule. It's about self-will. But the moment that I bring into awareness in my thinking that I need to present this body, I've now given it a platform at least to offer it to God. So I go by the way of the altar. This is where I die. Not in a physical sense, that's coming. But where I die means I die to my will. I die to self-reign. I die to self-will. That's the struggle in the church right now. We think we can talk to God, but I'm going to tell you something. Until you pray the same prayer that Jesus prayed. See, they crucified his body on Calvary, but he died in the garden. He died when he had awareness in his thinking of what he was about to put on that altar. And he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nonetheless, not thy will, not my will, but thy will be done. Right there is where he presented his body as a living sacrifice. And right there is where he died out. Right there. And see, a lot of us are praying, but we're still alive to our own will, to our own self-reign. We want it our way, and we're trying, to, we're trying to convince God to do it our way because we think it's a democracy. God doesn't operate that way. He's not asking you what way do you want to do it. He said, there's only one way, and that's me. And if you don't get rid of your way and come to my way, you're on the wrong way. Oh, praise God. Well, you, you, you still kind of lost me there, Brother Morgan, about the self work Okay, all right, let's finish that verse. You want to finish it, the next verse? And be not conformed to this world, but rather be you transformed. Oh, what? 
So I think the altar has a lot to do with my mind. I have to be willing just to choose to give it to him. And the moment that I chose to give it to him, I build an altar. <laughs> now I'm not going to be conformed to self-rule. Now I'm not going to be conformed to self-reign. Now I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of your that you might prove what is. So I can't get to the will of God until I've put it on the altar. Woo! And it's there in that battle and that struggle. I'm telling you right now, it's there in that battle and that struggle that we have this, the, 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 the battle between my will, his will. My ways, his ways. Do I want to wear the crown or does he going to wear the crown? I've got to decide. Oh, hallelujah. And the moment that you say he's going to be Lord of my life, that means you have submitted your will to him, which is true worship. And you've bowed and worshiped him, signifying to him, I submit my life. I, I'm going to be a living sacrifice. I submit my life. I submit my will. I submit my ways to you. You tell me now what you want. And I'm going to help you. He's talking about your body. There are people say, ain't nobody going to tell me how to dress. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do, how I'm going to look, and all that stuff and all. Body don't have anything to do with it. I've heard that argument until I want to puke sometimes. God looks in the heart. Why don't you finish that? Man looks on the outward appearance, only God can see the heart. So if they're going to see anything about God in you, they're going to see it out here. Mic check, won't you? Well, now, did anybody ever tell you, you are to be sanctified body, soul, and spirit. So don't get this stuff. It's my body. I can do with it whatever I want to do with it. I hate to tell you. Man, I'm about to mess this service up right now. He come to, they come to Jesus and said, who do we pay taxes to? And Jesus said, bring me a coin. So they brought him a coin. He looked at it, something of value, and he looked at it and he said, whose inscriptions on there? Whose image is on there? And they said, Caesar's. He said, then render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Watch him though, and unto God the things that are God's. So here's value of the kingdom here is the image of that on the on the value of the kingdom and so this is what you render unto caesar but render unto god the things that are god's so where's god's value where is god's image so if you render unto caesar the things that are caesar's you're to render this thing that god says that's the value and I put my image on that. So you're to give that back to me. I can't give it back to him until I've crucified my will and I've determined I'm going to live my life according to what pleases God. Oh, let's clap here a second. Well, glory. <laughs> I, uh, I was preaching for uh, Aaron Bounds a couple years ago. And uh, I've been there twice. Both times that I've been there have been just really something very significant has happened. And uh, so last time I was there, Sister Morgan was with me and we'd, I'd been to one of our conference, and I'd come back through and preach for Brother Bounds. And uh, that Sunday night, there was uh, tongues of interpretation. 
And the interpretation was, you have asked me where my fire is. My fire is reserved in the heavens. My fire is above the city even now. But you say, where is the fire? He said, my fire seeks an altar. And when you give me that altar, you will see my fire. So the prophecies have been seeing this fire. Mm. Old Mogi years ago, seeing that ball of fire coming toward the earth, seeing it splinter and going to different parts of the earth and the globe. But then the next thing is that vision that God gave me when that, when that, watch this, when that fire hit in front of the pulpit. That used to bother me. Why did it hit in the pulpit? Why in front of the pulpit? And then the other day it was just a simple answer. Well, that's usually where you have an altar. My fire's not going to fall in the pulpit. My fire's going to fall in the altar. You can't preach the fire down. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. You can't preach the fire down. It's going to be in the altar. And when it happened, the Lord spoke and said, the darkness will not prevail. Out of it came angels. So we know that uh, out of it. Now, here's the deal. Uh, mm, boy. Uh, Jacob's ladder. This is the house of God and the gate of heaven. Why is this place the gate of heaven? Because this is the place of the altar. So the altar is the key. It's the gate that unlocks access to the throne. You can't get to the true throne except by the altar. Churches that will build God an altar will become gateway churches. They'll become where God abides. There's no altar. There's no gate. It's locked. It's locked. You can't get to the true throne. You don't have a platform to stand on until you had an altar to die on. I told a young man the other day, I said, if you'd quit seeking a platform and start seeking an altar, you might get somewhere. Get right close. So we got this deal. So first time I seen that. Second time was in, I was in Colorado Springs preaching a conference, and man, they were worshiping, and I mean it was thundering in there. And then Brother Haygood, I mean I know y'all heard this a lot, but I need to tell it again for the sake of where we're at. And then I seen that ball of I heard that wind blow, seen the ball of fire hit in front of the in front of the pulpit again, and uh, then out of it with the angels that came. It was young men. They were bent in forward motion, kind of like this here. And the angels had a sword in their hand, but the, the men had a Bible in their hand, which is the same thing. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the angels with the sword meant they had God's Word. You really think they got literal swords in Michael and the Prince of Persia up there having a sword fight. Nah, that's not what I was talking about. I'm going to teach you something right here. The sword of the spirit. Every spirit has a sword. Words. Words. You have a sword. It's your words. You can cut and kill people with your sword. Why do you think Paul said all this other stuff's for your armor? The only thing you got as a, as a true weapon is the word. Why do you think that the Antichrist is going to have a sword? You know what it says? He will speak great words. That's the enemy's sword is his words. So faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the But fear comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the devil. So every spirit has a sword. 
It's his words. It's his thoughts. Logos. It's his thoughts. That's how the enemy battles against you. By putting his thoughts into your mind. By speaking words against God to you. And it just keeps coming at your mind. Some of you need to learn how to become a skillful swordsman. Because a word fitly spoken. A word fitly spoken. And when Jesus is in the garden or in the temptation and the devil gets to him and the devil's speaking words to him. In other words, he's cutting with his sword and Jesus says, it is. This is the will of God. You need to learn how to use the sword. All right, sit down. I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here. sword now so then the third thing uh, this is how when that happened I seen that one this is how I will set America on fire I will set local churches on fire coming out of that fire will be fiery evangelist okay all right and then I was in Chula Vista California preaching in a meeting and Several of us there, there's ministers and stuff, we had a team that went and kind of doing a crusade type deal. And, and uh, I was down at the church praying. I said, okay, God, you show me those two visions. But what in the world, what in the world do we do now? How do we get the fire? And that's when the Lord spoke to me and said, uh, follow the steps of Elijah. It's very important for you to get what I'm about to say. Follow the steps of Elijah. So I went to Mount Carmel. How long halt you between two opinions? You're a crippled nation. You're trying to serve God and trying to serve all these other gods at the same time. You're crippled. And then, of course, the Bible says that Elijah rebuilt the altar. Now, those other guys, they said they built an altar, apparently, but it was a platform because all they did was just speak, 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 speak. Of course, their God's not speaking back. And they're just going through this. And then Elijah took 12 stones. The Bible says he took 12 stones, which were the 12 tribes, which were the 12 sons of Jacob. Meaning he called the family of God to the altar. Then after he built that altar, what he's telling the people there is, is you need to submit your will to him. You're thinking all this crazy stuff about plurality of gods. You need to get back to what is really true and what's really right. And so then he offers the sacrifice, all the water, most precious commodity in the world. What was it, 12 barrels of water? They're in a drought. Saturates it, prays 63-word prayer, backs up, and the fire fell. Now watch what I'm going to show you. If God's truly going to set America on fire, if the vision is correct, if the vision is correct, seeing it there starting in California, going across California down the coast and then hitting right toward that I-10 corridor. Did you listen? And then it moves from the west to the east right across that I-10 corridor. I've told you the I-10 corridor is the old Spanish trail. That's why Catholicism is so strong in the very deep south here across that I-10 corridor. They're the ones that started it. This is even before Jamestown and all that stuff up there. St. Augustine, Florida, there's a gate there, and it says this is the gate to the Spanish Trail. It's still there. And so we watched that happen. So I called Brother Foss uh, before COVID. I said, Brother Foss, we really want to target this I-10 corridor. Now, you've heard this a lot. I know you're pastor, and you've heard I-10 quarter a lot. But let me help you with it. So I called him. I said, Brother Foss, this is what we believe. And he said, oh, my God, Brother Morgan. He said, no, a year ago, that was before he was superintendent. He said, I was in my motel praying at camp meeting. He said, it's early in the morning. He said, and God literally elevated me above the city of Houston and said, look to the west. He said, when I turned to the west, he said, I could see it in the distance. It was coming toward Houston. He said, and I seen a fire hitting the cities coming toward Houston, and I knew it was coming to Houston. Well, we know it's not just coming to Houston. It's going to come right through Houston, and it's going to come right down this I-10 corridor, and you're a vital part of that. 
God has designed you to play a lead role in that. Are you listening to me? But the key to this is, and this is what I'm trying to convince people is, we've got to quit trying to tell God how he's going to do this. This harvest is going to be different. We think we've got to figure it out, and we're speaking from our platform when what we ought to do is get to the altar and let the fire fall and consume. That's what we ought to do. And we're, we're getting ready to launch. November the 8th in Houston, we have a meeting with all the superintendents, North American missions directors, key influential churches across the side 10 corridor. We're going to launch it. So ready or not. And if these churches and these cities will come together as the family of God and get rid of your, listen to me, get rid of your autonomy. Because before we were districts and before we were sections, we were a family. And if we don't get back to being the family, I'm talking all the way across. Before we were organizations, before we were all this, we were the family of God, and God's trying to bring the family back together. And the where he's going to bring us back together is at the altar where all of our autonomy dies out, and we think this is the way God ought to do it. We think this is the way that God ought to do it until where the fire of God consumes us, he burns out of us our own thinking, our own ways. I mean, let me just say one thing here, and I'm, I am done. You better be careful when God starts telling you what his will is, and out of your own thinking, you speak against it. Who do men say I am? Thou art the Christ. Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. And by the way, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. That's the word of the king. And it's right. And Peter said, nope. Now watch him. He's going to join a rebellion. He's now about to become the enemy of God. Be it far from you. We're not going to let you die. Bless God, I got a sword. Absolutely not. Now, God's will had just been expressed. And out of Simon Peter's own thinking about how the kingdom should happen, he speaks. But he spoke against the will of God, and God says, Get thee behind me, Satan. You don't understand the things of God, only the things of man. You didn't come up with that revelation on your own. So quit trying to think out of your own reasoning, out of your own ability. Why don't you just come down here to the altar and you just die out and you let me establish my will and what I want and you quit trying to be king. I'm talking to some of you in the Holy Ghost right now. This is not Burger King where you get it your way. It's going to lock up right here. There's not Burger King where you get it your way. And you can say, this is the way I think. This is what I believe. This is the way I see it. And boom, 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 boom. And you can speak directly against the will of God. See, you don't have an altar. You're not even willing to allow your brain to be cognitive enough to at least put that on the altar to see if God will consume it. You won't even entertain the thought. You've already decided. It's already done. This is the way it's going to be. See, that's, there's no altar in your life right there until you're at least willing to put this on the altar, your idea to put it on the altar. You, you're you're going to reign your own life. Well, I, I, I think I know. I'm just going to be honest with you. God's working me over. You think you know, but you don't. I just need you every day of your life to come to that altar <laughs> Woo, thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven meaning build that altar submit your will to me on a daily basis Woo, and my will my word from the throne will be spoken and where the word of a king is there's power my word is right 
Now God's calling this church to the altar. He's calling you to the altar. God, I really thought I knew how this was supposed to happen. I really did. I, I really thought that I knew. I really thought that I, I was right. I really thought that. Woo. You're never truly right until you give yourself the ability to say, I could be wrong.
We appreciate your attendance. We would like to invite you to tune in with us weekly and share your worship service experiences with someone else on Facebook or YouTube. Also, for other anointed and inspirational clips, you can follow us on Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter. If you would like to give, please follow the links below for further instructions. We pray that the Lord would bless you and strengthen your home this week. We thank you for worshiping with us, and we invite you to worship with us again in our next service.